So today, uh, uh, speaker, it's, it's a privilege to introduce a very good friend of mine uh, for many, many years. I'm not going to say how many, Dima, <laughs> but we'll keep that in secret. Uh, so Dima Woodke from uh, Berkeley. Dima has had a very distinguished career in precision measurements, uh, looking at uh, the things like uh, do the fundamental constants change in time, looking at uh, is Lorentz invariance really uh, <coughs> invariant and things like that of nature. And to do that, he has had to learn to do exquisitely <coughs> precise and sensitive, uh, develop sensitive probes. Along those probes, he has developed some of the most fantastic magnetometers <laughs> that you can imagine. And it is the magnetometry that he is going to be telling us about that. But uh, Dima is one of these very, very successful, let's say, scientists that combines a lot for <coughs> fundamental physics, for asking deep questions on fundamental symmetries with fantastic developments that, uh, uh, in our case, what we'll hear is about magnetometry that uh, have uh, branched off to many other things. Among other things, uh, many of you know his book on problems of physics for the quals. Those of you who are preparing for the quals, I recommend Dima's book, but he just has a new book and he will tell us about, uh, about magnetometry. Thank you very much for coming. Great to be here, and uh, meet old friends and make new ones, and uh, to tell you a little bit uh, about what's going on. Now I had a big dilemma because uh, there are quite a few exciting things going on uh, in our lab and in our collaborators' lab, and uh, so uh, I had to, to pick what to, to tell you about. And so I decided that instead of uh, digging very deep into one narrow topic, uh, I'll give you a rather shallow uh, overview. Uh, of uh, a few different things, and then uh, if you're interested, we can talk some more after the presentation. So, uh, as a prologue, I would like to uh, tell you a few very general words uh, about magnetometry with atoms. So, uh, magnetometry with atoms has three stages. Uh, on the first stage, we shine uh, polarized light, Light is very easy to polarize onto paramagnetic atoms. And in the process of interactions of light uh, with the atoms, we transfer the polarization to, uh, to the atoms. And in the simplest case, we uh, orient the spins of the paramagnetic atom in some particular direction. That's stage number one. In stage number two, What's going to happen uh, is uh, the spins evolve in the presence of magnetic field. And the simplest type of evolution is just recession here. The magnetic field is drawn in the, into the plane of the drawing. So it will just cause the spin to precess. Uh, in uh, other cases, the, the evolution could be much more complex. For example, if you take into account uh, also, in addition to the magnetic field, the uh, interaction with the light beam, <coughs> oftentimes you have an evolution effectively in, in a system of crossed uh, um, electric and magnetic field. And then you have a very complex, generally very complex evolution involving processes like orientation to alignment, conversion, and whatnot. But in the simplest case, you're dealing with just a spin precession. And then finally, uh, in uh, uh, all optical magnetometer, um, you have uh, another uh, light beam. This is uh, a probe beam, which could be the same beam as the pump. In many schemes, it will be the same beam, but generally it could be another beam, which somehow uh, probes uh, the direction of the spin either by measuring the changes in absorption or by measuring, uh, which we like better, the rotation of the polarization plane of the light. And so this is sort of a, a general uh, scheme with tons of different variations uh, on it. But from this basic scheme, you immediately write um, uh, sort of the um, quantum noise limit on the sensitivity. And uh, I'm kind of proud. Uh, this is uh, I, I, we were not the first people to write this equation by far. It, it, it goes maybe 100 years back. 
However, uh, in some of our papers, it was equation one, and now I go to meetings on magnetometry, and I'm very happy to see that people refer to this equation almost semi-officially as equation one. So, <laughs> so I'm very happy about it. Anyway, uh, so uh, this equation tells you what, uh, what the resolution uh, you can, uh, in a magnetic field you can strive to achieve. Usually you, you, you fall short of this because of various technical problems, but this is sort of your, your goal if everything is working well. And uh, you, you will notice that a lot of the things here are fundamental constants. So this is the magnetic moment uh, of an atom you're using. This is the Planck's constant. And, and sort of the meaningful combination of letters here is the number of spins you are interrogating, or the number of paramagnetic atoms. Uh, and then the spin relaxation time, and then the measurement time. And this formula assumes that you are measuring uh, longer um, uh, than the spin relaxation time. Uh, and so if somebody tells you, uh, I have thought of a way to make a super sensitive new magnetometer, you ask them, so which one of the letters <laughs> have, you, have you managed to, to improve? Either you're trying to work with more atoms or, or increase the relaxation time. So the, the figure of merit uh, very generally is the uh, square root of n tau for a magnetometer. Um, and uh, just to give you the colors are really not so great here, but we can see what's going on. Uh, just to give you an example, um, uh, one of many of how, how this is all coming together in a particular system I'm going to uh, briefly show you nonlinear magneto optical rotation with frequency modulated light that uh, has this horrible abbreviation uh, FM and MOR. And the features of this particular approach that you use basically room temperature alkali vapor cells. This is one of the pioneer, uh, one of the uh, pioneers of optical pumping magnetometry, academician Alexandrov, um, that, who is holding in his hands two uh, two of the vapor cells. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more uh, about these vapor cells later, but the idea is um, that uh, the inner walls of these cells are coated with anti-relaxation coating. Uh, because what happens if you if you have a polarized atom and it, it's a uh, bare glass wall, it sticks there for a while, and when it's coming off the wall, it, it, it doesn't remember its polarization. It's completely depolarized. However, with these coatings, you can uh, make it bounce thousands uh, and a million times, as I'll show you later, and this increases the relaxation times and so it uh, directly impacts the sensitivity in equation one. Um, so uh, if you uh, put the numbers for this cell, for example, uh, into equation one, you get sub from the Tesla potential uh, sensitivity for a one second measurement. This is hard to achieve with these systems, but uh, 100 or even 10 femta Tesla is more or less routine uh, at the moment. And this particular frequency modulated nonlinear uh, non magnetic optical rotation technique also has uh, a, an attractive feature that it has broad dynamic range and you can measure uh, earth fields uh, and sort of small deviations from the, from the field of the earth um, which is used to detect uh, either uh, nature or, let's say, uh, man-made magnetic <laughs> anomaly. Uh, this is a this is a euphemism for uh, Russian submarines. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, so the way this the way this works, uh, you you shine your like I'm sorry about the colors. Um, um, uh, so. What, what this uh, uh, red thing represents uh, <coughs> is uh, uh, the polarization state um, of the atoms. Uh, what this is is um, actually um, angular momentum <coughs> probability surface. I'm not going to, to go into detail uh, about what this is. Let me just say that uh, this picture uh, is completely analogous to the full density matrix of the system, believe it or not. And uh, if you have unpolarized atoms, uh, the picture uh, will show that by this, uh, this uh, representation being a sphere. So no, no preferred direction, no preferred axis. What you uh, see here is a, is a peanut shape 
uh, distribution, and what it tells you is that the atoms are uh, not oriented because orientation corresponds to a particular direction, preferred direction in space, but they are aligned, which, which means that there is a, a, a preferred axis, but no preferred direction. And so what happens uh, is if you have your uh, vapor cell and you shine linearly polarized light, uh, you uh, create uh, such an alignment in the atoms, and if you have a magnetic field uh, uh, applied in the direction of propagation of the light, this alignment recesses like everything else with a lot more frequency. And um, uh, normally uh, what will happen if you have this magnetic field uh, sufficiently strong, uh, your light is making the spin and structure uh, align vertically, let's say, and magnetic field smears it out. So, uh, so from, from this uh, peanut, if you imagine that you sort of average along those rotations, you will actually get a donut with an axis along the light propagation direction. And why we love these pictures is because without any calculation, by looking at them, you can say what, what they will do to the light. So uh, for the peanut, you immediately see that the refractive index, let's say, or absorption for, uh, for light propagating uh, along uh, the axis of the peanut and perpendicular to it will be different. But if you have a donut uh, which is uh, aligned that way, uh, all directions will be the same and so there will be no effect on light polarization. And so here, uh, in order to, to, to reinforce uh, this uh, structure, what we do, uh, instead of keeping lights uh, steadily on resonance, we uh, actually modulate it synchronously with this armor precession. So we, we take it off resonance uh, when we don't want the light to spoil this beautiful peanut. And when, when the peanut is oriented uh, in a way that the light will reinforce this peanut, we bring it back on resonance this way. So this way we are able to pump this macroscopic evolving polarization in the whole cell. And then we use the same laser beam actually uh, to probe um, the degree of this uh, polarization. and. Um, this allows us to, to make a very simple magnetometer. So what it has uh, is the vapor cell uh, between uh, uh, a polarizer and analyzer in a balanced configuration. So these are two photodetectors. And there is a diode laser. And then um, as, uh, as uh, this peanut uh, uh, turns here, we see the uh, oscillating differential uh, signal. And uh, uh, if we now, for example, uh, fix the frequency of the modulation and then we, we scan the magnetic field, what we see is uh, various families of very narrow resonances, about one hertz in this case. Uh, and why are they very narrow? Because uh, the width of these resonances is determined by the relaxation time in our vapor cell. And these are, like I said, the special cells with anti-relaxation coatings where uh, the lifetimes are on the order of, of a second in this particular case. So you see uh, one family of resonances that occurs near zero magnetic field and this is good for measuring very small magnetic field. For example, if you are doing an electric dipole moment search or something like that and you want to measure very small fields, you, you may use those resonances. But uh, if you want to measure the Earth field, you use this, uh, just e equally narrow family of resonances, and you can put them anywhere you like, including uh, the Earth field. And um, it's already uh, more than 10 years old and has been widely applied to uh, applications. I want to mention here that uh, a couple of years ago, there was sort of a breakthrough um, Whereas uh, in the previous 40 or so years, um, the best codings uh, allowed about 10,000 bounces of the polarized atom before uh, depolarization in a cell. Uh, quite unexpectedly, a, a new uh, class of coding materials uh, have been, uh, has been found. And uh, this support uh, about um, uh, a million of bounces. And, and what you sh uh, see here is actually uh, an electron spin relaxation time of uh, uh, about 77 seconds. I think it's a record, uh, so longer than a minute in a, in a vapor cell. And here is the, the record uh, breaking cell. And uh, this is Misha Balabas, our colleague from Russia, who is a wizard of 
anti-relaxation coding and, and then the rest of my team um, working on this at that time. Now, uh, can, you, can you tell us what that material is? Yeah. Uh, so that material is very much like paraffin, uh, but uh, paraffin is a, a fully saturated hydrocarbon, and and uh, and this one has one double uh, bond, uh, so slightly unsaturated. And uh, we thought uh, uh, the story there was that uh, Misha came to me and said, uh, I have a hunch. That's alkenes. Uh, alkenes. Uh, uh, my uh, alkenes. This is this, uh, not the concentrated part. Can can work uh, a little bit better than uh, alkenes. And I said, but but Misha, everybody knows that the double bond is best for this. And I said, well, let's try it. And I said, okay, well, let's try. And we tried them. Uh, actually, to to get the 77 second coding is just one. Uh, thing that you have to take care of. The other thing is uh, you have to really have an exquisite control on your magnetic field gradients because they will kill you. You have to deal with uh, the issue of spin exchange collisions and so we use uh, a, an unusual uh, variation of the surf regime here, spin exchange relaxation three to kill the effect of the spin exchange collisions and uh, a very poetic thing, you have a a cell and it has a, a sidearm where you keep the metal, the reservoir, or like we, we call it um, uh, a cell stem. And so you have to actually plug it with a, with a plug because otherwise the relaxation is determined by that, that, that stem. And so we have, uh, that this cell has a spe special mechanism where depending on its orientation, the little glass bullet closes. So actually, uh, I I I I, uh, I was really worried about uh, uh, funding uh, for this project because it's stem cell research after all. <laughs> <laughs> but luckily, <laughs> anyway. Uh, so um, these atomic magnetometers have been uh, uh, developed very nicely, uh, and um, major applications. I'm going to mention some of them you uh, shortly, but in the meantime, there is another uh, system uh, that is becoming uh, very, very interesting and might actually be better uh, than atomic magnetometers in a certain class of applications. And, uh, <laughs> and this projector truly doesn't uh, give, <laughs> give sufficient credit to this beautiful diamond here, but the point is that... <laughs> The point is that, uh, and I, I apologize because most of you, of course, know, know a lot um, uh, about diamond, but <coughs> given the, 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 the numbers in the audience, I'm, I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about the basics of the color centers in diamonds. So uh, if, you, if you have uh, a perfect diamond which just has carbon, uh, a perfect carbon lattice, it's a very boring thing. In fact, we can buy this for about $60 now. Nowadays, and this is a three by three by 0.5 millimeter size uh, single crystal uh, of of diamond, and it's it's really very very cheap, and and it looks just like a piece of glass. It's very boring, uh, and it turns out that all the beauty of the diamond comes actually from imperfections um, in the lattice, and uh, these are called the color centers or F centers from from the German word Farbe, and the, the center of particular interest to us, um, <laughs> actually, uh, our colleague Lillian Childress uh, 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 once described the center, and I, I, I can never forget how, uh, how she described, uh, described it in this most beautiful description. She said, imagine um, this beautiful, um, uh, perfect lattice, and you come in, and you grab two carbon atoms, and you take them out, then you take a nitrogen atom and you put it back instead of one uh, of the carbons that you uh, uh, just removed. And then you get this system. Uh, so this is a substitutional nitrogen and there is a vacancy next to it. And it turns out that this thing has a, a set of really amazing properties. So and V that you will hear a lot stands for nitrogen <coughs> and vacancy. Now, uh, it turns out that uh, everyone in this uh, audience who can spare uh, a little bit of money to get the diamond or, or has friends with diamond can do this uh, experiment. Uh, you take a laser pointer and you shine on 
Oh, okay, you need to prepare this diamond uh, uh, to have many and we send this to do it. But uh, if you prepare this sample special, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, in a proper way, then you, you find that there is sort of this yellowish fluorescence coming uh, out of it when you shine the laser pointer into it. Um, and um, so what is, uh, what is that that we are seeing? Well, if you, if you put this fluorescent light into a spectrometer, um, and uh, this is shown, it, essentially this experiment, except at a somewhat low temperature to make all the features a little sharper than at room temperature, but the difference is not so, so large. You see that there are some uh, sharp lines. Now, the excitation is uh, green, 532 nanometers. And, and the, uh, the lines that you see, they, uh, they start uh, at about uh, 638 uh, uh, nanometers, there is a sharp line there. And then there is a broader uh, feature at even longer wavelength. And it turns out that all this system is due to uh, this NV center that is negatively charged. If you look a little more closely, you see that there is a similar structure here uh, due to the um, neutrally charged NV center and V0, but we uh, are not interested in that, that much because it has, um, uh, you know, less favorable features. So what we see here is, uh, this is a, what's called a zero phonon line, um, a transition, uh, let's say, from the bottom of the uh, excited electronic state to the bottom, uh, uh, zero phonon line. Yeah, here we go, zero phonon line. Um, and, and then uh, this uh, 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 is called the phonon sideband. Is when um, you have a fluorescent uh, emission. It doesn't go to the bottom uh, of the ground electronic state, but also excites several, uh, one or several phonons. And then this leads to a broader feature here. It's called the phonon sideband. And uh, what you notice here is that while the excitation is green, uh, the uh, emission is yellow and red. Uh, and uh, this is, of course, uh, known as the stoke shift that uh, frequently, uh, when you have phonons present, your emission uh, is at uh, smaller energies than your absorption. So, um, here is actually the energy level structure uh, of, um, of the center. It has the ground state, and this is uh, the phonon sideband of the ground state, and this is the excited uh, electronic state. And it turns out that the ground state uh, is a spin triplet. It's a, it's a very symmetric state in terms of um, uh, orbital uh, properties. It's basically uh, an analog of the uh, 1s uh, state in, in an atom. It's fully uh, uh, symmetric, but uh, its spin uh, is one, and so you have uh, magnetic sublevels here. Uh, the m uh, sub s equal to zero is split by about three uh, gigahertz um, due to the fact that it's a crystal uh, after all. But uh, uh, plus minus one sublevels remain degenerate in the absence of the field. And if you apply a magnetic field, there is a Zeeman effect, so they are first order sensitive to magnetic fields. And it turns out that uh, this system is also sensitive to electric field. And, and so this is the basis for it being used as a magnetometer and an electrometer. And there is also uh, a singlet system over here, and this will be um, important, although I'm not going to go into too much detail about this. So, so what I'm going to um, uh, emphasize, though, is uh, I'm going to try to explain why all the rave about the NV center. What's so special about them? Uh, well, first of all, it turns out that uh, it is possible and actually fairly easy to address a single uh, NV center. So we have a single quantum system available for you here. Uh, the ground state, as I said, is paramagnetic, so you can use it for electric and magnetic field sensing. Um, it also turns out that the ground state uh, of um, the system is uh, um, supports very long uh, spin relaxation times. If you uh, don't do anything special, you can get uh, spin lifetimes up to maybe two milliseconds. If you don't do anything, I'll tell you uh, what happens if you do something <coughs> special. But uh, I hope you'll be impressed by what I have to show you. 
later there. But uh, remember equation one is n tau, and uh, tau is the coherence time. So long coherence time um, uh, translates in, into high sensitivity. If you are into quantum computing, this is also great because um, uh, you, know, you can manipulate the ground state uh, with uh, microwave fields, for example. And if you think of it as a qubit, the long lifetimes allow you to, to do many operations uh, while the system uh, is still coherent. Then uh, you just need green light like this to optically pump the system. Um, um, I uh, don't have time to go into this in detail, but if you just take that diamond and shine your green light, uh, due to the fact that <coughs> the crossing uh, into the singlet system uh, depends on the magnetic sublevels, if you don't do anything special, you don't uh, don't even care about the polarization of the light. You will polarize uh, everything into m equal to zero state. So you can optically pump very easily. And similarly, uh, the fluorescence uh, after you re-excite uh, from the ground state depends on whether you are in MS uh, plus minus one or MS equal to zero. Again, because uh, the uh, sort of crossing into the singlets where the centers can hide um, from the light for a re relatively long time. Depends on them. You can not only initialize the center, you can also probe which quantum state it is in. And uh, the transitions here are about 3 gigahertz, very convenient for manipulation. Uh, and on top of that, uh, the center is uh, essentially infinitely photostable. So, so you can get as many photons as you want, and biologists are interested in this uh, uh, as uh, fluorescent markers because they, they can put diamond in, in, into uh, living tissues and, and just use it as a, as, a, as, a, as a marker. And there are many other things, but I hope this is already a pretty impressive list. Uh, what I want to mention uh, to you, if we are talking about, say, magnetometers, now, now coming back to the, the overall picture uh, of magnetometers. So this is a plot that is very hard to, uh, to keep current. Uh, so in fact, this is a few years old now uh, because there is, it's a very uh, active field and there are always new points here. But what it shows here uh, is uh, spatial resolution on the horizontal axis and uh, sensitivity uh, in this technical units of Tesla per root hertz uh, to magnetic field. And the one important thing that you to take from this plot is that there is generally a compromise between the sensitivity and the spatial resolution. So if you want to have the best atomic magnetometers, um, they will be um, magnetometers that have large cells, a few centimeter type cells here. And in principle, you can also measure things with um, atomic resolution, but then your sensitivity is orders of magnitude worse. So an interesting thing about the, uh, the diamond uh, systems is that um, uh, these circles that you can barely see because of the colors here show that uh, diamonds have a very good combination of sensitivity and spatial resolution, and therefore they can contribute uh, at, at a different scale. So there are sort of generally two lines of attack. One is uh, single centers, um, uh, single and V centers over here, and th these are usually ensembles in this area. And I should uh, put a plug for, for a book uh, that just came out, uh, well, in, <clears throat> published by Cambridge University Press, and it's called Optical Magnetometry, and um, it's a collection of 20 chapters written by, by the uh, uh, leading experts in this uh, field, and Derek Kimball and I um, co-edited this book. So if you're interested um, in a chapter, for example, on the basics of uh, uh, diamonds as sensors and, and atomic magnetometers and applications, uh, maybe it would be of interest to you. Uh, I want to mention something, and this slide uh, I uh, borrowed from, uh, from Michel Lukin of Harvard, who just uh, visited, and this tells rather interesting story. Um, a couple of years back, um, uh, my, my then student, uh, Victor Acosta, who is now 
uh, postdoc at Harvard, he, he was trying to uh, use a very simple <coughs> diamond magnetometer to measure the Meissner effect in a high temperature um, superconductor. And I, I bought that superconductor on, uh, online for about $15. It's a demonstration <laughs> kit. And so Victor had this uh, um, uh, diamond and, uh, and the and B magnetometer next to it, and he had a, 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 a container with liquid nitrogen, and he was trying to, to cool the superconductor to, to observe the, the, uh, the transition. And for some reason, his, uh, his hands were slightly shaky that morning. Uh, and so what he did, he accidentally spilled some uh, nitrogen on the diamond. And I, I was uh, in my office a few doors from the lab at that time, and Victor comes in and says, he, he used to call me boss for some reason, said, boss, I don't know what's going on. Uh, the, I, I'm looking on the scope, and my line is just walking off the, off, the, off the screen of the scope. I don't know what's going on. So what was going on, as it turned out, was uh, that uh, Victor, that they discovered uh, a, a, a rather strong temperature dependence of this um, zero field splitting between m equal zero and m equal to plus minus one uh, a diamond near room temperature. Uh, and uh, we then measured it and uh, we're surprised that even though the system um, had been studied for a long time, nobody reported this earlier and we wrote it up uh, and uh, uh, we actually were pretty upset about, about this because uh, this effect turns out to be about a factor of five larger than, uh, than what you would naively um, expect from, uh, from, from the data on, on thermal expansion of the crystal. And, uh, uh, and at, at first we thought that this is just a horrible, horrible systematic problem for magnetometry. <coughs> And uh, immediately we started thinking about the ways to mitigate it. And in fact, now there are very good ways to mitigate it. It turns out to be not such a huge problem for magnetometry. But, but that is how we presented it in that paper, that this is a effect that you know, all magnetometry should care about. Well, other people were a little smarter than us. And they said, why don't we use it as a thermometer? <laughs> and, <laughs> And in fact, uh, there are about, uh, about five or six uh, groups around the world uh, who are using this now uh, as a thermometer with very, uh, I, I know that uh, Jake <laughs> is involved in this uh, 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 temperature sensor work. Um, uh, Jake, by the way, is one of the pioneers of uh, sensing the diamond. Uh, uh, I don't know yet about that. So, um, so what people do are, uh, is actually amazing thing. That, so the Harvard group, for example, um, uh, found that you can put uh, very nicely little nanodiamond crystals inside the living cells, and the cells don't mind at all. And uh, what you can do is you can uh, use basically one laser to measure the temperature. Uh, right now, maybe with a millikelvin to root hertz sensitivity, but eventually, with some tricks maybe down to micro Kelvin and another laser is killing uh, the same cell uh, by, by thermal uh, you know process and uh, and so you can measure ex explicitly well what happens and what temperature actually you affect this and so the hope is that this will become um, a way to diagnose cancers and, and, and maybe even treat them so and there are other groups. There's beautiful work in, in Germany and also uh, in, uh, in Melbourne. And, uh, so this is all quite exciting. Uh, OK, so uh, there is actually a, a whole bunch of other things that, that are going on. Uh, and this is uh, a very small list of things uh, that actually my group is uh, involved in one way or another, including gyroscopes. Um, based on diamonds of measuring high temperature superconductivity, as I mentioned. Um, and I just want to uh, give you a couple of examples of what's going on um, to whet your appetite, I guess, for the system. So one um, is the idea that maybe you can make a fully nuclear polarized solids. And this now is starting to move towards this other, other part of my talk that will be on NMR. But this is 
sort of a, an NMR person dream. You will have some object, uh, which is macroscopic like this, and all nuclei in this could be made uh, polarized. I think we are not there yet, uh, but we are certainly moving very close with time. And so the idea is, um, and I should say that it was first uh, demonstrated by uh, a couple of, uh, of groups in, with single centers, including the group of uh, uh, Lillian Childress uh, who pioneered this. And now we have shown that this works uh, in large ensembles as well. So if you, if you look uh, at uh, the structure uh, of the energy levels of the NB center as a function of magnetic field, so this is your M equal to zero, sublevel M minus one, M plus one, uh, you see that you have a very similar structure also in the exciting state. And uh, uh, as a function of magnetic field, what you can do is you can um, bring these levels to near crossing. For example, this uh, crossing here is called, um, or anti-crossings as we will see. Uh, this is called the E-slack, excited state uh, level anti-crossing. And there is also a G-slack uh, over here. And uh, again, I'm not going to, uh, to, to follow uh, th this plot, especially because uh, the colors are not very nice in, in detail. But what happens here is, um, uh, Due to hyperfine interactions, uh, the, the, the energy level states uh, that are very close to, to each other over there, uh, near crossing, like, like I said. Um, the fact that you are constantly doing optical pumping on electron spin actually translates into very nice optical pumping on the nucleus as well. And uh, the first nucleus that you would be interested in, uh, you know that most um, nitrogens are N14. Uh, so there is uh, an N14 nucleus right inside the NV center. And um, uh, normally, uh, when you look at, uh, at one uh, um, line um, in the uh, op magnetic resonance spectrum, you see that there is a uh, hyperfine structure that splits the line into three. And then when you go to this uh, ESLAC and do the same kind of optical pumping, what you find is that these three lines actually collapse into one, from which you infer essentially 100% nuclear polarization of that nitrogen. You also see that there is a little bump here, and uh, it turns out that this bump uh, tells you that you have also polarized not only the uh, nitrogen 14 inside the NV center, but also the carbon 13s in the vicinity of the center. Um, if, uh, this, 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 in this case, um, uh, uh, in the immediate vicinity of the <clears throat> of the center, it's it's uh, specifically the third shell, as they call. And so we we've shown that this works very well uh, in an ensemble, and it was published just recently. And then the question arises. Uh, so imagine that you have your NV center. Uh, over here. So we already know that we polarized the nuclei in the immediate vicinity. Is it possible to somehow, I um, don't know if it will show, yeah, look at that, to somehow use that to propagate the nuclear polarization into the bulk? Um, and um, an experiment like this has been set up, in fact, by, by this fellow. Um, this is Ron Fisher. He is a graduate student from Technion. Uh, in Haifa, who has spent a couple of summers in my lab and, and then moved on to set this experiment uh, at the lab of another collaborator, uh, uh, Professor Lucio Friedman at the Weizmann Institute. And what these guys have done, they, they, they have a, a, a normal uh, high field NMR system, it's a 5 Tesla magnet, and uh, they measure uh, the fringing field of the, of the magnet and they find this place where uh, this 500 Gauss where the e slack occurs, and it is there that where they set up the polarization measurement. And then they also have um, um, uh, you might, if you go to Costco, maybe you've seen the, how they, how at, at Costco they, they transfer paper between one part and another. It's a, it's a pneumatic transport system. So it turns out that that, that idea was borrowed from NMR, and NMR people often shovel 
their sample. So they also set up a, a shuttling system so they, they can polarize uh, uh, polarize their uh, diamond here and then bring it into uh, into the magnet for measurement. And there is a pulse uh, sequence uh, where there is pumping, shuttling, and the mass sequence, and then it's shuttled back. And uh, uh, to make the long story short, um, uh, we have a, a paper uh, uh, on the archive that that shows that we have at least 0.5 percent uh, polarization in the bulk. Uh, I can tell you, as a as a matter of secret, that in certain runs it was up to two percent, but we didn't want to uh, sort of present the, the data that we couldn't really reproduce easily. Uh, and this corresponds to thermal polarization at about 2,000 Tesla. So it's a really big deal. And we think that this is only the beginning. And with material engineering and, uh, uh, and our improved understanding, we will be able to achieve higher polarizations. Moreover, it turns out that very small changes in the magnetic field allow you a, a, a very good control, uh, not only of uh, whether there is polarization or not, but you can also flip the sign. In fact, if you if you look sort of at the at the de de detailed dependence on the magnetic field, you can see that you can nicely change signs. Um, anyway, uh, I'm going to leave this topic now, except for saying that uh, this also works very nicely in the ground state level anti-crossing, and there is uh, a paper that's uh, in press in Nature Communications, and, and this work with the, the GSLAC uh, is done by uh, the, the group of Alex Pines in the chemistry at Berkeley, and uh, it works very well, and there is not only a nice experiment, but also a pretty detailed theoretical understanding of uh, what is happening here. Um, okay, so uh, now I'm going to, to tell you a little bit um, about how you can increase the relaxation time in diamond if you if you do play some tricks. I told you that it could be milliseconds if you don't play tricks. Now let me tell you what, what happens if you play some tricks. But before I do that, I have to tell you uh, about the T1 longitudinal relaxation uh, of the electron spin in diamond. And this again, uh, the energy level structure here. And um, recently we have studied uh, the D1 relaxation here in a variety of samples as a function of temperature, magnetic field, and so on. Uh, we have uh, some uh, rather unsophisticated pulse sequence and get uh, data that looks like this. But the point is that uh, when we plot uh, the uh, D1 relaxation rate <coughs> as a function of temperature, uh, for different samples, we find a rather interesting behavior. We find that uh, at uh, high temperatures, above, let's say, 100 Kelvin or so, uh, there is a universal behavior. Um, that pretty much all samples have uh, the same relaxation. And that, so this is attributed to various phonon-related processes. But when we cool the sample down, then what we find is that uh, uh, the only parameter uh, that determines the relaxation, which now becomes independent of temperature, is actually the concentration of nitrogen vacancy centers. And we did some additional experiment to, to prove that. Now, uh, this is important because uh, what I'm going to, to tell you is our results, um, not on the uh, longitudinal relaxation, but now on, on transverse relaxation, and this work has just been published um, a few weeks ago, and this is a collaboration between Ron Walsworth's group at Harvard and my group, where uh, we were able to actually uh, get an ensemble uh, T2 time almost to a second in a solid state system. We, we, we were quite, <laughs> quite happy to do this, and the idea uh, comes, of course, uh, uh, from nuclear magnetic resonance and specifically from the Han echo. Um, and I, I'm sure everybody heard about uh, Han echo. So, so what we do is uh, we, we have uh, uh, just slightly more sophisticated versions uh, where we have multiple echoes, uh, which are called the CPMG 
um, uh, sequences. And um, uh, so it, let me just tell you that you take uh, a, a sample. And I'm going to tell you about a couple of samples. So this is one of them. Uh, <clears throat> and first, uh, this is going to be at room temperature. And you measure the T2 relaxation time, and it is uh, a microsecond or so, one microsecond. Now you apply a one Han echo, and what you see is that the relaxation time is about three orders of magnitude longer. So just one echo does an amazing job, three orders of magnitude. And uh, again, I, I'm not going to explain in detail uh, what this oscillation is. Let me just say that uh, this is due to the fact that uh, this is a normal diamond sample where about 1% of carbons are C13s. And what you see here is, is a collapse and revival due to, due to those nuclear spins. And um, we will get rid of that uh, by, by taking an isotopic nuclear sample in the following plot. So I'm not really um, spending too much time. So uh, then you see how, how much improvement you, you can get uh, if you use it more sophisticated <coughs> sequences. And you have, uh, OK, 16 pulses. Now you are uh, up to 1.5 milliseconds. And, uh, and then you go to, uh, OK, so I, uh, it, you can't really see uh, on this plot. But OK, so, so this was, um, this was uh, Oh, gee, that's bad when you can see this. So this is this, and now we increase the number of pulses, and we have an even longer relaxation time. And if we plot uh, the coherence time as a function uh, of the number of pulses, then you know we we are already definitely in, into uh, many millisecond uh, range. Uh, although uh, we, it turns out that we can't really uh, improve it further. And uh, we can't improve it further because the T2 relaxation time becomes limited by T1. And so now, uh, to, to go for the longest possible time, we do a couple of things. First of all, we take a nice isotopically pure sample where all carbons are C12 now. That gets rid uh, get, uh, This way, you can get rid of this fast oscillation. Uh, and also, we cool it down. And then we repeat the experiment. And now, uh, what happens is uh, we can reach uh, very, very long relaxation times. So like I said, um, uh, 0.6 seconds is the record. And in fact, um, here uh, it shows you what, what happens uh, as a function of temperature. So these are these curves, the, the coherence time as a function of number of pulses, and uh, this is room temperature, this is 240 Kelvin, and so on, and this is now 77 uh, Kelvin, and, and there's your one second over there. So it's pretty amazing, and we feel that this is not the end of the game. Uh, now we are limited uh, by other things, uh, not just P1, and we are trying to improve this, and hopefully we'll have a longer uh, lifetime for the ensemble. And again, uh, uh, why this is uh, so uh, exciting, we go back uh, to this classic paper by this first author and co-authors, which, by the way, this paper played a hugely important um, role in my life because I, I, I didn't really know much about NB centers and certainly wasn't uh, working in NB centers, but these guys uh, dragged me into this, and I'm very happy that they did. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, but anyway, um, so um, it turns out you, you might say, okay, so you apply some some kind of uh, you echo, uh, and uh, and the reason the echo works is uh, is there are some perturbations that you are uh, uh, capable uh, of canceling. For example, some magnetic fields, constant magnetic fields. So, is, aren't you also making your system completely insensitive to magnetic fields? And it turns out that no, in fact, uh, you don't. Because uh, uh, oftentimes you, you want to measure an oscillating magnetic field, like in an NMR experiment. And then, if you synchronize your pulse sequence with the frequency of the, of the field, um, then you can make what's called an AC magnetometer. And then, in fact, 
you directly uh, improve the sensitivity of that magnetometer because what, what you have to plug in for that tau here is now T2. So it's very exciting for us. And a lot of ideas for new applications of that. So uh, one thing I want to mention briefly, how much time do I have? Five minutes. Um, so as a prologue to, as, a, as the first minute of that five, uh, I want to say that um, uh, in the April issue of Physics Today, uh, uh, Michael Ledbetter and I have written up uh, this uh, zero field nuclear uh, magnetic uh, resonance uh, paper. And I was hoping uh, a picture from this paper will make the front cover of Physics Today. It did not, but, uh, but there is a little blurb. And if you look at that issue, what uh, the editor put there, it said, new lows for NMR. That was <laughs> 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 so anyway, uh, uh, in NMR, any kind of NMR experiment, once again you have three stages. I thought everything consists of three stages. And uh, the first and very important stage is, is polarization. So you take a sample and then you need to somehow polarize your nuclei to get your signal. And uh, normally this is done in high field using uh, thermal equilibration. However, there are clever techniques that you can use, for example, spin exchange optical pumping uh, or uh, parahydrogen induced polarization that do not, uh, in fact, uh, require any magnets or any strong magnets. I should make a comment here that if you're working with a single spin or a small number of spins, then you don't even need to, to polarize at all because you can be uh, doing what's called a spin-noise spectroscopy, and when n is equal to 1, square root of n is also equal to 1. So your noise signal is just as strong as, as your polarized signal. <clears throat> but uh, actually, my group does not work in that regime. Uh, we work with large ensembles, so we need some polarization trick to do zero field on the mark. Um, so the second stage after polarization is encoding. You, you have to somehow encode the useful information into your spins. And there are sort of two major modalities in nuclear magnetic resonance. One is called spectroscopy, where you don't care where the spins are, but you want to know if it is butulism or, or, or uh, anthrax or whatever, you know. Uh, and, uh, and the other modality is, uh, you know that you're looking for protons, for example, but you, you want to know where, where they are, and uh, this way you can image the system. So, um, and again, it turns out that in classic uh, NMR, you need strong magnetic fields for, for everything. You need strong magnetic field gradients for high resolution uh, in encoding here. And, and, um, and here in spectroscopy, uh, the chemical information is encoded in, uh, in what's called chemical shift. What, what is it? Have a magnetic field, but uh, the nucleus doesn't see that magnetic field directly. There is uh, usually diamagnetic screening due to the electrons. And it's a very small effect, and so these chemical shifts are uh, usually measured in units of ppm, parts per million. And so in order to resolve your chemistry, you need to apply a very strong magnetic field, typically. So here we use uh, another uh, kind of encoding called J-coupling. Uh, I don't know if I have time to explain what it is, but it also doesn't require any magnetic field. And finally, uh, if you detect with a squid or an atomic magnetometer, uh, then you don't really care about this, uh, the, the, the signal uh, frequency. But if in a classic NMR, you use Faraday induction, which uses d, d, d phi uh, dt, uh, and this d dt gives you uh, an um, uh, omega, Larmor frequency. So again, you need a very strong magnetic field. So now you can see how uh, playing various tricks, uh, we can actually get rid of, um, um, of uh, any magnets. And in fact, uh, it works. Uh, for example, this paper reports uh, an experiment where we did uh, polarization using parahydrogen and detection with an atomic magnetometer and uh, got some very nice spectra. And, uh, and now we are doing sort of detailed uh, chemistry. Uh, this paper just came out um, in the Journal of American Chemical Society where we apply this zero uh, field of MR techniques to study various uh, aromatic 
uh, components, and, and you see that the spectra uh, give you a very nice uh, passport for what you have inside for these various components. So uh, just coming to an end, uh, I, I think where it all is going uh, is quite exciting, uh, and it has to do with microfluidic NMR. So uh, what am I talking about? So everybody, uh, even if you have not yet taken the electronic course that we heard advertised, you already know that an electronic chip is a, is a tiny little uh, box out of which you have various pins sticking out which bring the electric currents in and out. Uh, you can uh, now have a microfluidic chip which also looks like a little box, but instead of the wires there are little tubes that bring your chemicals in and out. And so on board of this chip, you can uh, have uh, a chemical analysis laboratory. It can also uh, be a synthesis laboratory that synthesizes your, uh, your drugs in the quantities, uh, very small quantities that are just needed for you. I actually think that for three or for five years from now, our shorts, uh, uh, our clothing will, will contain a uh, microfluidic chip which will monitor uh, our health in real time and also administer drugs and also call the doctor when we're having heart attack or something. So I think we are very close and, uh, uh, to that and I should say that um, a few years back uh, in collaboration with the group of Alex Pines and, and John Kitching at Miss Boulder we have actually demonstrated the first uh, microfluidic chip with an MR detector uh, on board with an atomic magnetometer but now there is very active work and first results already of microfluidic chip uh, using diamonds. So it's really exciting. In summary, uh, lots of smiley faces. I told you a few words uh, about atomic magnetometers, uh, optical magnetometers, and then uh, hopefully uh, convince you that diamonds are good as well, and uh, said a few words about the zero field and the MAR business. Now, uh, this is my diamond team at Berkeley uh, at one point in time. Um, and, uh, yeah. Nice standing right behind you. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, actually, that's actually Dr. Brian Patton, who is in charge of our uh, warm magnetometer. So for some reason, uh, you can see that this is actually, pur this is actually purple hair. So, so you, you can't see this on this one. Yeah. And uh, uh, the uh, and Amar work is uh, in collaboration with a group of uh, Alex Pines and he, his Pine Nuts, as he calls them. So, so thank you for your attention.